Oh, yeah. Here we are. CXM Experience. And I am your host, Grad Khan, CXO, Chief Experience Officer at Sprinkler. And so we are continuing our series on the digital customer first transformation system. And uh, we just covered the maturity model, one of my sort of favorite parts of it. And I think it's my favorite part of this because the whole point of digital transformation is to try to take an organization into the future. Now, it's, it's so kind of funny because when I went to, um, I started at Microsoft in 2006, and uh, I was in Microsoft Research. So in MSR, pre, it, was, it was pretty advanced, right? Like we were on tablet computers, if you remember those, and, but we were, very, we were fully digital and it was, it was great. And I, uh, I loved it. It was like, and I had been in that kind of modality for a long time because I'd been in some really pretty interesting startups. I was in the peer-to-peer space. And so it was very natural for me flowing into the MSR culture. The only thing that was unnatural, and I don't, I don't say this very often, but when Microsoft hired me, they hired me partly because I was an open source person. Uh, so I'd come from the open source world. And um, truth be told, um, the first day that I used a PC like uh, or, or a Windows machine uh, was my first day at Microsoft. <laughs> so, I remember, I remember, <laughs> sorry, I was like, I was like Mac and like, and like mostly Linux, like only. And, um, and I'd, I'd been with some folks like Corey Doctorow and John Henson who are like fanatical uh, Linux users. And I mean, Corey, I once showed Corey a PC. This is just a few years ago. Uh, Corey and I were hanging out. We were at, uh, I think we we're at the Disney uh, campus. He was working a little bit with the, the Disney folks. And uh, I showed him my new Surface PC. And like, he literally wouldn't touch it. Like, he was like, he was like, that poison won't touch my fingertips. So it's pretty funny. Anyway, so, um, and so my, my, first, uh, my first day, they gave me a, a Windows machine. And you know, I've obviously heard about Windows, but I'd never, I never used it. <laughs> and it was pretty similar, uh, f- incredibly similar, actually, in many ways to, to Mac and Linux, but there's differences, right? And so, and we were also, because we were in MSR, we were on the latest OS. And so the OS that was just launched in 2006 was uh, Vista, if you remember Vista. Uh, and Vista was an interesting OS because they had been on uh, XP for quite a long time, and they were working on a, a new OS that was uh, internet-based. And it, was, uh, it, it ended up kind of not working. Like they just, at the time, broadband wasn't fast enough, wasn't scaled enough, and uh, that, that particular OS... Uh, ended up as a smoking ruin on the ground. And so they very quickly had to build a new OS because at the time, new OSs were an engine of revenue growth for the company. And it had been five years since there had been a new OS. So Vista came out, but very hurried. And it was you know much maligned. People still make jokes about Vista. What's kind of funny is that Windows, uh, Windows uh, 8 and Windows, nine, Windows 10, there's no 9, <laughs> You know what happened to nine? Uh, how's it work? Uh, nine, eight, ten. I think that's how it worked. No, no, ten, eight, nine. Things like that. Um, and uh, so those all the new OSs that they exist at Microsoft are all based on Vista. And so Vista is still like essentially the operating system we're using in PCs right now. Uh, it's just you know they've had several modalities of maturity since then. Uh, so anyway, so I'm sitting down with this new Vista machine. And uh, and I don't know how to do a bunch of stuff. Like, it's just like, there's a bunch of stuff I don't know how to do. And I just like foolishly said to someone, hey, you know, if you want to blankety blank, how do you do that in Vista? And they kind of gave me a weird look, right? And they're like, oh, same way you do it in XP. I'm like, ah, cool. Excellent. Excellent. You know, all right. And so, you know, I went on the web and found out how to do it in XP as well. And, uh, and then off I went. And, you know, I'm a pretty good PC user. Actually, I love PCs now. Now, now I, I'm a PC fanatic. So it's funny how things change. Anyway, so um, let's get back to the topic. So today we're going to talk a little bit about, um, we talked about the maturity model. Today we're going to talk a little bit about uh, where we're going from an ROI standpoint. And so the, the whole point of DCFTS is, you know, how do you get 
alignment and how do you get everyone in the organization on the same page? And so um, so that's where we're going to go with this today. So one of the great ways to get people on the same page uh, with any kind of initiative is to talk to them about ROI. And uh, an ROI is, you know, a great way for people to understand what they're doing, why they're investing time and energy, you know, why they want to do it, et cetera. And so there are sort of three ROI categories that we focus on, revenue, cost, and risk. And classically, every company wants to grow revenue, wants to reduce cost, and wants to decrease risk. It's not that super surprising, but we call these primary business objectives. So increase revenue, reduce cost, decrease risk. And so in the ROI model, what we, what we have in the DCFTS are some examples of how you can, you can do those things. And if you get very granular, and this is actually on the Sprinkler website, you can look at each individual product, there are five products in the Sprinkler family, and see a variety of use cases that help you achieve these different primary business objectives uh, by product. So it's, it's, it's pretty compelling. I recommend you take a look at it. But let me give you some examples from DCFDS, just so you sort of understand how that plays out. Uh, so uh, under grow revenue, so let's assume that you want to um, activate online, offline, and in-store marketing initiatives, right? So you want to integrate social care with marketing to build, deepen, and, and strengthen your relationship with customers. Uh, so basically what happens is that you've got uh, better customer knowledge, more personalized responses, and uh, you can turn detractors into promoters. Uh, what we've seen when companies have done this and done it well is they generate $2.33 for every dollar they invest in the effort. So it's, it's paying out uh, more than uh, 200%. Another use case would be to integrate social engagement into omni-channel strategies to get a unified view of the customer. And this is like the holy grail of, of everything we do in marketing. How do I get a unified view of my customer so I can talk to them in a way that they understand that I know who they are? Uh, and so, you know, how do you look across a variety of different media and how do you drive social engagement to multiple channels? And so, um, you know, how do you increase your content sharing, uh, increase word of mouth and get your overall campaign performance up by treating people like individuals? And what we've seen the companies have done that is they generate $2.21 for every dollar they invest. So more than 200% there as well. Uh, another great use case is to build and grow advocate communities. Um, there's some, I had an example about Subaru uh, last week, but advocate communities are an amazing way to take people who love your brand and want to uh, show how much they love it uh, and turn them into acolytes for your brand. There's, a, there's this kind of interesting issue around cognitive dissonance that you can lever in these uh, advocacy communities. So there's this pretty interesting statistic, which is, the majority of buyers of car magazines, um, and they're still like, you can still find them on newsstands. It's actually one of the last magazines standing. If you go look at a newsstand and look at a magazine rack, what you'll see are these car magazines, and they'll have multiple brands, like a lot of brands on the cover. So what's going on there is they understand that the people who buy the magazines have mostly 70, 75% of the time have mostly just recently purchased a car. Let me make sure you get that clearly. They just recently purchased a car. They're not thinking about buying. They purchased it already. They go in the store and they see this magazine and it says, you know, Acura Legend or whatever. They grab the magazine. They flip to the Acura Legend article and it says, great car. People who bought this car are smart buyers. <sighs> I'm buying this magazine because this magazine shows me that I made a good decision buying the car that I bought. So this, this issue of cognitive dissonance is, is a huge lever with, with individuals because it's something they want to get rid of. So it's always good to keep selling after the sale, to keep reinforcing to people that they made a good decision. And once that they really lock in, they will become incredible advocates for your brand because they want to show everyone else how smart they were in making that decision. So uh, people that do that and do that well create community activation uh, and kind of get affinity multipliers uh, going on and they create an advocate network. And we've seen people generate more than $2 uh, return for every dollar invested there as well. 
content. Let's talk about how content should be personalized. You know, the great thing in these networks is you can actually personalize the content. At Microsoft, hundreds of thousands of pieces of content are personalized every year. At Sprinkler, we, con- we personalize all of our content as well. It has a massive impact. When you get an ad made just for you, you have a very different reaction to it. Um, when you do that and do that well, you get organic amplification because people retweet the ads you've sent them, and that grows across their own networks. So you get organic amplification that's very difficult to get normally. And we've seen returns of $4.68, nearly 500% for every dollar invested in those kinds of initiatives. And finally, how can you leverage social selling to nurture leads and convert them into customers? Uh, and so the sort of non-targeted sort of sort of spray and pray approach you know, doesn't really work. Uh, with social selling, you're looking at specific targets based on specific accounts, based on the buying committees that you've identified. And then you go after those people, follow them, and send them very specific personalized messages. And companies that do this can generate $2.94 return, nearly 300% for every dollar invested, which is, is pretty amazing. So that's a good example of kind of the revenue side of the equation in terms of how you drive it. I'll spend a, a minute or two here on the um, cost. So on cost, you know, one of the great things about Sprinkler is that Sprinkler can do a lot of different things. And many of these things are individual point solutions in most companies. So it was one of my favorite things at Microsoft to do is to take point solutions that we were spending money on and eliminate them and have Sprinkler do it instead. So by the end of the time that, by the time I left Microsoft, uh, Sprinkler was literally free uh, because we were saving so much money by all the other point solutions we'd shut down. Uh, what we found is that companies that do a really focus job on eliminating point solutions and creating a single platform will uh, save $11.80 for every dollar they invest. So that's a, a massive 10x return, 10x plus return. You can also get a lot of cross-functional collaboration uh, and that'll drive customer delight and functionality uh, as people see what's working and not working. So being able to see what content is effective and not effective Um, That also reduces costs by having people not replicate content they don't need. And we've seen Siemens, for example, they talk about a 50% reduction in content production costs and a 10 times increase in the effectiveness of their content. Partly they're not replicating content they already have, and partly they're seeing what works and being able to use that over and over again. So very powerful in that kind of collaboration element. You can also uh, leverage social case management to uh, do customer care. And so you'll be able to, you can redirect uh, or you can have customer care occur on these asynchronous channels, which are way less expensive. You know, doing customer care on WhatsApp is way less expensive than doing it on the phone because you can have multiple WhatsApp conversations going at the same time with an agent, whereas in a call, you know, it's a dedicated connection. And so that's usually um, about a third of the cost of what it normally costs in a traditional call center. Uh, And we're seeing... That's one of our fastest growing products, a massive movement, movement there as well. And then, um, and then you, know, you can also drive peer-to-peer social care, right? So build communities, build portals, build peer-to-peer social care so that people don't even need to call you. They can get it from other people. They can get it from other advocates. They can get it from other folks who can help them solve their problems. In that case, it costs you nothing because essentially all of the effort that would go into customer care is being handled by your own customers two other customers. And that's a super effective uh, a methodology, usually about $5 in savings for every dollar invested there. So almost 500%. And then finally, um, you know, how do you shift your marketing spend to social? And, and as you do that, you know, improve your targeting, your amplification and your reach. And so typically, as we see companies shift more and more into social spend, they'll save, uh, they'll, they'll sort of save about $2.54 for every dollar that they invest because every dollar is working a lot harder because the target is a lot more specific. And so that's the kind of the reduced cost section on the, uh, on the risk section, you know, risk is interesting because risk is different for every company, but I'd say that the, the key issue for most companies is that they don't see the risks that are coming at them. And so by having a better risk management and identification system, you can identify risks before they occur. We have one customer who said that we had helped them uh, eliminate 237 
potential PR risks in the previous year by just being able to spot stuff in advance. It's pretty amazing, actually. And so you, know, you, you, you see uh, both at the large, medium, and small size, you know, different types of risks that can, uh, that can occur. Um, let's say you're a large financial company. Um, you can have a data breach. How do you manage that? If you're, say, a large national retailer, a sort of mid-sized kind of company, um, what about there's a social media crisis? Someone says something that's inappropriate on your channel. Uh, in a fast-growing tech company, what happens if you have a cyber attack? What happens if you're a distributed company and you've got one of your distributors saying something that's inappropriate? How do you manage that? And being able to track, manage, and see that all at the same time is an extremely effective way of managing risk in the company. So that is the ROI model. And again, I'd encourage you to read it. There's much more there to read than what I've just kind of gone through. But I think you get the idea. And the core of it is, hey, I can actually use this technology to drive revenue, reduce cost, and decrease risk. And that goes a little bit to the values model that we talked at the very beginning of this series you know, a week and a half ago, which is making sure that the investments that you're making in digital transformation are investments that drive the bottom line and drive success of your organization. And that's always going to be the way to get people aligned. And that is all for today. Thank you for listening. This is the CXM Experience, and I'm Brad Kahn, and I will see you next time.